Welcome to the National Library. I'm Richard Foy, Chief Archivist for Archives New Zealand. Um, before I introduce tonight's amazing event with an amazing crowd here, um, I thought I'd just be a run through some of the health and safety and housekeeping uh, messages that I'm always obliged to give. So the first thing is that the bathrooms are located in the stairwell at the far side of the main hall. So I'm just pointing in the general direction. You'll see some signs there, signage for the bathrooms. Uh, if we need to evacuate the building, please go out through the main glass doors uh, to Molesworth Street and make your way across uh, to the Court of Appeal across Aikman Street. So just out there and across to the Court of Appeal. If there's an earthquake, drop, cover, hold and stay put until you're given further instructions. Don't run outside. You are very safe in this building. I myself have been in this building when there's been a very shaky earthquake and it was very safe. So, uh, so before we, uh, I sort of introduce uh, to the talk, um, I just want to say, as Chief Archivist, uh, I have statutory responsibility as kaitiaki of He Whakaputanga o Te Ranga Tēnatanga Aungu Tūrini and Te Tiriti o Waitangi and the New Zealand Women's Suffrage Petition. I noticed a lot of you, uh, a number of you went into He Tohu before and, and, and enjoyed the exhibition in the document room. Uh, I don't know if any of you left finger marks on the cases. <laughs> if you did, I have to go and tidy them up <laughs> after this. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, despite being the chief archivist and the, they being under my care, uh, I'm not an expert, so it's wonderful to be here tonight to listen to some experts, people who have studied uh, these documents. Uh, and in, what a great day uh, to be having this. It's just one week after Waitangi Day. But as actually I like to say to everyone who comes to Etuhu, every day is Waitangi Day here. Every day is Women's Suffrage Day here, and every day is Te Whakaputanga Day here. Um, so in this talk, our panellists, uh, Dan Puri Orange and Morgan Godfrey, uh, will discuss Te Whakaputanga and Te Tiritia Waitangi with the Chair, Carmen Jones. They're going to explore the history of these remarkable, incredible, precious documents over the past two centuries. And they're going to reflect on and talk about maybe a bit of debate um, about their significance for us as New Zealanders uh, in a 21st century New Zealand. Uh, to mark the He Tohu exhibition, um, Archives New Zealand and the National Library of New Zealand collaborated with Bridget Williams Books to produce three books that tell the story of these iconic New Zealand documents. Each book features an introduction to the document, uh, full colour reproduction of the document pages and the biographies of the signatory. So you can see them just up there. They can be purchased at the National Library shop after the talk, which is just over there. Please buy them. They're fantastic books. I've got a set. Buy the box set. It's really great. Buy one for yourself. Buy one for someone you care about. Buy one for someone you don't like. <laughs> The store also holds another, uh, a number of other books um, from Bridget Williams' texts and publications by Dan Quirio Orange and Morgan Godfrey. Buy lots of them. <laughs> Finally, um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Carwin Jones. He's of Ngati 
Kahungunu and Te Aitianga uh, Mahaki descent. His main research interests are the Treaty of Waitangi and Indigenous legal traditions. He's currently senior lecturer at the Victoria University School of Law. He's also worked at the Waitangi Tribunal, Māori Land Court, and the Office of Treaty Settlements. He is the author of New Treaty, New Tradition, and is the co-editor of the Māori Law Review. And I'd like to introduce, um, welcome Cowan to the uh, victim, and you can introduce our other panelists. Thank you, Richard, for the introduction and uh, the organisers of this evening's event, and of course to all of you who have come along. It's really fantastic to see so many people here this evening. So I'm just going to, uh, first of all, initially introduce uh, my two uh, co-panellists here and, and explain a little bit about the format um, for this evening before we get going. So just uh, by way of introduction, first of all, uh, we've got a couple of uh, fantastic people here to speak about He Whakaputanga, uh, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we have just to my right here, Dame Claudia Orange. Uh, and Dame Claudia will be well known to many of you. She's an honorary research fellow uh, at Te Papa Tongarewa, the Museum of New Zealand. Uh, and she previously headed the museum's history and Pacific cultures section. Uh, she's well known, of course, for her uh, book on the Treaty of Waitangi uh, from 1987, but also has been involved with, as the general editor of the Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, a major project from 1990 to 2003, she's acting chief historian from 1997 to 2000 uh, at the History Group in the Department of Internal Affairs. And uh, she was awarded an OBE in 1993 and uh, an, a distinguished companion of the Order of New Zealand in 2009. So we're very lucky to have Dame Claudia here with us tonight. Sitting next to Dame Claudia, uh, we have Morgan Godfrey. Now Morgan may also be well known to many of you. He's uh, a writer, trade unionist, he's based here in Wellington. Uh, he's an online columnist for Overland Literary Journal in Australia, and he's a regular book reviewer for Fairfax Publications. His, his writing regularly appears in The Guardian and The Herald. He also appears on radio and television as a political commentator. Uh, he's authored a number of academic chapters uh, and lectured on topics relating to Māori politics. And I'm also pleased to say that he's a graduate in law from Victoria University. So the format of this evening is that um, we're going to have short presentations from each of us. We'll begin with Dame Claudia and uh, then I'll come back to talk to you again and then we'll have a, a short presentation from Morgan. And that's a good reminder to, um, this now might be a good opportunity to make sure your cell phones are turned off or at least switched to silent. Um, so each of Claudia, Myself and Morgan will give us a short presentation. There'll be opportunities for questions from the floor at the end. So if you could, if you have questions that you'd like to put to any of us, please keep those in mind and hold them till, till the end. Uh, we're going to give a short presentation each. Then we're going to have some, I have some questions for both of these two uh, that we'll have a little discussion about. So we'll have a short time for that but I will make sure that there is an opportunity for questions uh, at the end from the audience as well. And we'll aim to finish uh, by around seven o'clock so that we're keeping good time. Okay, I think that's all I have to say in terms of the format and the structure of the evening. Uh, and so with that, I'd ask you to welcome Dame Claudia Orange to speak. <laughs> I think um, one way of looking at the Declaration of Independence 
is that we can call it the good constitutional type document of our country. And you might well wonder why we haven't heard about it. It's largely the court um, again because it didn't quite work out the way it might have been intended to and it was superseded by a treaty. But first of all, what does it actually say? It really is an assertion of New Zealand's independence and also sovereignty held in a collective way by a confederation of independent hutters who were always wanting to be independent, in fact, very often at different times. One or other would have fought, would have fought each other and still did so little bit after the confederation agreement. But it also is important, really, for those of us who've worked um, on the treaty and related um, factors, in this sense that it set the scene, in a way, uh, for the British move in 
citizens for the pecuniary restraint um, in, in his experience in the Bay of Islands that actually resulted in deaths on both sides, Maori and Kiwi. And another spill in 1831 had caused a group of chiefs in the Jersey area to petition the British Crown for, for, for protection. And so this new potential threat was the driver that brought the chiefs together to meet at Waitangi and discuss <coughs> the threat, the potential threat. Both these drafted a declaration of the country's independence and it was presented here for discussion. So he wrote it in English. Henry Williams, who also felt that maybe they'd better do something, um, translated it into Maori, and Irwe Ricardo wrote it up as the final text. So it was a combined effort, really, of missionary Maori and um, Taiki. What, what does it say? Well, you can see that in front of you there. Its title is really quite important because it was, you know, relates to the treaty later. Te Pokaputanga, a coming out um, expression um, of the Rangatiratanga Oluhea, the new Kirimu. The first part says um, that it's a country that behaves in the Rangatira, an independent state. The second article really says, Potakinitanga, Potumana i Tefenua, sovereign power and authority rests with the Confederation of United Tribes. That's, of course, they were only in the north at that stage. This confederation, Pokumunanga, was moved annually at Waitangi to frame laws for the benefit of the country and they'd invite others to join. And the confederation would send the de declaration to the King of England and seek protection for their developing nation state. And how many signs? Well, 34 chiefs who were at um, Waitangi signed on the 28th of October, 1835. And over the following years, um, more signed until a total of 62. It was mainly signed by those in the north, um, but others signed too. Te Hapuku, um, of, the, of the area that today we call Hawke's Bay, and in July 1839, quite late in the piece, Te um, the chief of Waitago Kainui, signed. Um, in fact, he was a tribe that signed for him, but I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have signed had he not been in authority. The British government, and this is the important feature, acknowledged receiving the declaration, and this set the scene for the treaty making. Um, in decision making uh, and taking the move in New Zealand, it really had to take that declaration of sovereignty into consideration. They acknowledged receiving it, and the country's independence status is also well known internationally. A United States consul had been appointed, for example, in 1839. So in decision prior to sending William Hobson to New Zealand in late 1839, the government had to recognise it, even though actually doubting the capacity of an indigenous people to accept sovereign independence. And this, of course, leads into the treaty. Um, Hobson had instructions that um, he would make a treaty. He had to take, he could take all of New Zealand or part of it. He wanted the whole. Um, we'll come to that conclusion. And he was instructed um, all, of all different things which I think The next person is me again. Um, so thank you very much for that, that introduction, uh, Dame Claudia, uh, and to the, to the declaration and its content. And I'm going to pick up a little bit more on uh, some of that content and some of the terms that are used, particularly leading into uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi uh, and, and how our understanding of the concepts that are contained in Te Tiriti o Waitangi are very much informed by those concepts that we see in He Whakaputanga. And essentially there are kind of two, two key points that I want to touch on in, in these brief comments. Uh, and the first is, is the one I've already mentioned, just that those ideas about autonomy and independence that we see coming through in He Whakaputanga are absolutely crucial to understanding the constitutional relationship that has been established in Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And then secondly, 
The other thing I think is really important about he whakaputanga in a kind of constitutional sense is that it helps, I think, to illustrate the point that the constitutional relationship between Māori and the Crown is more multidimensional than, than simply Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Though I, I would argue that Te Tiriti does provide a kind of primary lens through which we understand that relationship, but that's not the beginning and the end of it. So just to, to, to come back to this idea of a constitutional relationship, what am I talking about when I'm talking about a constitution or a constitutional relationship? And I think one of the quite simple ways that I, I like of understanding this is Matthew Palmer uses in his book on the Treaty of Waitangi, and he describes the constitution as expressing or determining who exercises public power and how they exercise it. Another aspect of, of how I like to think about what a constitution might entail comes from uh, Moana Jackson and the report of the uh, Mātake Mai Aotearoa, which is the uh, independent working group on constitutional transformation. And in that, the report says, in functional terms, constitutions are based on what may be termed a concept and a site of power. So the concept of power is the idea or philosophy a society develops about what constitutional authority is and the values or interests that underpin it. And then the site of power is the institution or the place where a society decides that power might be exercised and then the limits and the parameters of that public power. So for example, in the context of uh, what we might think of as a largely European tradition where we have constitutional authority largely concentrated in, in a monarch in parliament, often. Um, and although I, I do want to make the point that uh, the idea of sovereignty in that context, particularly through the, through the 18th century at least, uh, in that European sense, was not maybe as hard and as fast as we might think of it today, in the sense that it didn't always mean denying the existence of other authorities. Um, and so, for example, the British Empire was actually quite proud of the fact that in its empire it had the provision for quite a range of legal diversity through the 18th century at least. Now, other groups, of course, have different ideas about what public power is and what constitutional authority is and needs to be for their own purposes and how they structure that. Um, we might think of uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederation in northern New York, you know, the state of New York and southern Quebec, uh, where they have six different nations who have come together and have, um, have a long history of diplomatic engagement between those nations in order to um, provide structures that deliver on the autonomy of those nations while making collective decisions. In the context of Māori and Aotearoa, uh, largely I think we'd say that the concept of power is bound up with uh, the idea of mana, that exercise of authority and certainly of, of public power. And the site of authority is uh, often referred to as um, being situated with rangatira, with those leaders or chiefs. And that's where we see some of these concepts in He Whakaputanga and then later Te Tiriti um, come to be really significant and important. One of the ways in which I, I, I like um, have heard people describe what, what a rangatira is and the, the constitutional parameters of what a rangatira does is from the late uh, Manuhuya Bennett. And he said, Te kaia te rangatira he kōrero, so the food of the chief is speech. Te tohu o te rangatira he manaki, the sign of a chief is nurturing or caring for others. And te mahi a te rangatira he whakatira te iwi, so the work of the rangatira is bringing together the people. Um, and so we see here that the, the kaia the rangatira, that sustenance of that authority, is giving voice to the concerns of the people and articulating the needs of the people. The tohu or the sign is the obligation to manaki to look after not only the, your own people but also uh, others as well. And the, the kind of key work or the function, the role of rangatira 
is uh, to bring the people together, which also entails thinking about relationships with land um, and resources and how to husband those as well and um, respond and engage with those. So those are that's the important kind of site of authority is captured in the, those ideas around what a rangatira is. And we see that in the language of He Whakaputanga uh, and indeed later Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And as, as Claudia's already mentioned, we see even in the name of He Whakaputanga that it's He Whakaputanga o Te Rangatira Tanga. So it's capturing that idea of, of rangatira. And where, where the, the declaration talks of independence in an independent state, it talks about rangatira tanga and he whenua rangatira for an independent state. It uses ideas of mana where we see uh, in terms of where it talks about what in the English is described as sovereign power and authority in the Māori text uses phrases like kingi tanga coming from the English word for king but mana i te whenua and um, this has been, some people think mana i te whenua means authority over the territory um, there's a, lo a lot of evidence from Māori linguists from the north who say, well, mana i te whenua is really talking about that authority that comes from the land, not authority over the land. And again, we see those ideas coming through in these concepts of autonomy and independence and authority coming through into Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And so we see one of the key guarantees in Te Tiriti o Waitangi being that guarantee in Article 2 of tino rangatiratanga those very special absolute qualities of chieftainship, that self-determination and autonomy. And when you look at that guarantee of tino rangatiratanga in Te Tiriti, it has to be understood in the context of the statement, or initially in 1835, but as Claudia has already mentioned, Te Whiro Whiro was signing only a matter of months before Te Tiriti o Waitangi was signed. The way in which we understand the autonomy and authority and the, the, the statement of independence that's contained in the declaration. Now, just, and, and so that, that, that's really the essential point that I want to make is that when we're looking at what the treaty says about the constitutional relationship, it needs to be underpinned by what we know about uh, what He Whakaputanga says and how those ideas of rangatiratanga and mana are expressed there and understood by those who were signing. The other quick point that I want to make before I hand over to Morgan is just this point that, uh, that Te Tiriti is not the only interface between Māori and the Crown. And I think in, in, in Aotearoa we tend to think of that relationship being mediated only by the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, but in fact, of course, there are a whole range of, of different agreements between Māori and depending on where you go around the country. So He Whakaputanga is very important in the north, for example. But for Te Arawa and around Rotorua, we have agreement, what's known as the Fenton Agreements, which form an important part of their relationship with the Crown. And, um, and in um, Te Uruwera, you have agreements between Tuhoe and the Crown in the late 19th century, which then lead on to legislation and become an important part of framing that relationship as well. And now, of course, we have treaty settlements in different parts of the country, which are all about the relationships and the, the constitutional relationships between Māori and the Crown, uh, and, and also informed by things like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as well. So the, the, point that I, the second point that I want to leave you with then is that even if we think about the treaty as providing the really central framework of partnership, I think we can better understand what that means in the range of particular circumstances if we look at these other dimensions and the other, these other facets of the Māori Crown relationship so that we understand that the relationship between Māori and the Crown doesn't begin and end with the signing of Te Tiriti of Waitangi on the 6th of February in 1840. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Morgan Godfrey to uh, give some thoughts on He Whakaputanga. Last week, where something unusual happened, a sitting Prime Minister acknowledged Te Whakaputanga, the Declaration of Independence, as a living part of this country's history. Speaking last week at the Upper Marae at uh, Waitangi, Jacinda Ardern told the audience 
that she hopes her child will live in a country with a history of the treaty and the history of the Kapitina, but not distant events in an interesting but relevant time. Instead, she wanted her child or wants her child to grow up in a country where our earliest constitutional documents are part of a living history, part of a history that's present for you and I and for future generations. You know, it, it was a lovely sentiment, and it was a Prime Minister doing what she does best, talking to us. But as some have pointed out on social media, the Prime Minister did not go as far as she otherwise, otherwise might have. Yes, she said, if I could put it in that, is historically significant. But she did not say that it was constitutionally significant. She did not take that further step. I'm a little bit sympathetic to that criticism, if you can call it a criticism. But I also think it's only half the story. The other half is the context, or the context rather than just the content. On the Manai speech making is more than mere rhetoric, and it's more than mere rhetoric because it's always remembered. And Jacinda herself invited the Marae and the country to remember what she said that day, and in a year's time, and in two years' time, and three years' time. She invited them, she invited us, to hold her to account for what she said about the Kapapitina. So in other words, if in three years' time, if Akaputina is no more a part of this country's national life than it is today, then we can call the Prime Minister on it. She may not have committed to a concrete act, but she did commit to that accountability. And I think that matters. And I think what she said about living in a country where the history of Hepakaputina is present matters in another sense as well. Because in our unwritten constitution, when a Prime Minister speaks about what matters within that constitution, in this case, if I could put in that alongside the treaty. When a Prime Minister acknowledges that, then that itself is probably constitutional. The courts don't have the final say in our political constitution. Instead, what makes up our constitution, the declaration, the treaty, and more, is a matter of consensus. It's up to us. So I guess what I'm trying to say with that is if I could put in that as part of the constitution, it would make the argument for me. And people are making the argument. You know, Jacinda's decision to include that reference to Hipakaputina and her formal speech and her informal speeches in Northland last week was taken on the advice, um, I have a good authority, of her northern ministers. So of the current ministry, nearly one third are Māori, and of that third, one half are from Ngāpuri. So that's Tuna Hianari, Jacinda's advisor on all things Māori, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters, Labour Deputy Leader Calvin Davis, and New Zealand First Minister Shane Jones. So that ministry work is perhaps closer to our constitutional history, at least in a very personal sense, than any other ministry in the past. So those northern ministers know how important Te Whakaputina is in the living history of the north, and so they encourage Jacinda to speak to it. But I think the really important point here is it's easy to get up and think that this is the beginning of a top-down change. But what Jacinda and those northern ministers were responding to is something that's been happening from the ground up for a long time anyway. Um, as Jacinda was acknowledging, if I could put in at the upper marae, only a less than a kilometre away near the lower marae at Waitangi, activists and scholars and members of the public were learning and debating if I could put in at the, what they call the political team, something they have done for decades. I think in our national life, um, we often think of, at least those of us who know about it, we often think of if I could put in that as the treaty's poor cousin. You know, the runner-up to their English constitutional documents. <laughs> but, sorry, <laughs> low blow. But the other person that has been um, with us for you know, a long time, obviously, with the iwi of the North, with scholars, and with activists. Activists who even in the 1970s used to say the treaty was a fraud and this country's authentic constitutional document was he whakaputina. Those were the days before, you know, tinorangi tibetanga flags, and instead on marches you would see the red white and blue of the United Tribes status, Kuru you mentioned earlier, one of the forerunners to Te Whakaputina. But I guess this is the thing about the declaration in our national life. It's always been with us, but only just below le that level of public consciousness. Awareness of it comes and goes, but it remains waiting for another generation to make of it what they will, to learn about it, to debate, and perhaps to elevate it. Um, in Aotearoa, where I'm from, if I could put in there, is still sometimes looked at instead of the treaty, despite the Te Rangiti of Ngātiaka signing the treaty. And for those of you who were driven um, through places like Te Teko or Whakatāne, or even Ruātiki, Tangātua, uh, 
they were part in a whale hope, you will sometimes see those united tribes' uh, flags flown as, alongside like, the two little Manuka Hapu flags. But what I think, uh, returning back to Jacinda and that speech, what I think her speech signals isn't necessarily an elevation. I think what it does signal is this new generation trying to define Te Whakapusuna as a national story. As Callum alluded to, Te Whakapusuna alongside the treaty, not above it, but not subordinate to it either. In her speech, she mentioned the treaty and Te Whakapusuna in partnership. In the political uh, tent at Waitangi, the two documents are usually debated in partnership. If you go on the marae, the two uh, documents are sometimes debated in partnership, in dialogue with each other. And I think as people from uh, Ngāpuhi take a greater and greater role in public life, uh, think of those northern ministers that I mentioned earlier, as they take a greater role in public life, so too does the history that they bring with them. And I think that's really important. What they bring with them is this history that Te Whakapusuna is not an alternative necessarily to the treaty, as some people said in the 1970s or wanted it to be. And nor is it a simple nullity to borrow the phrase used against the treaty. Instead, it's part of our living political and constitutional history. But in the end, it's up to people like us to make it so. Thank you, uh, Morgan, for those comments, and Claudia for yours earlier as well. So we've got some time now for... A I've got a few questions for you. <laughs> and um, the first thing I'd um, like to come to you, Claudia, just we've heard Morgan talk about a little bit about her whakaputanga and its role in our kind of national story. Now, you're someone who's done a lot of work on thinking about our national story and promoting our national story and, and, and information about it. So I was just wondering whether you had any reflections on the way that Morgan has characterised the role of her whakaputanga there. Well, actually, to be honest, I, at this stage, I'm not 100% sure, and I think this is where it would be quite fun to toss it back and forth, and uh, you people, the audience, to think about it. And maybe tying it up a little bit to Taika, to the treaty, to help, it, help uh, us all understand it a little more. I mean, one of the key factors in um, the approach that Britain made to New Zealand was to secure and, and negate or nullify um, that agreement of sovereignty, uh, on sovereignty, that had been made in 1835 to 1839. You know, and if you um, understand it in that sense, I mean, Hobson himself counted 26 out of the 40 or so signatures at Waitangi <coughs> were in independence <coughs> signatures. So he was after those. He felt so confident that that, that night of the night of the 6th of February, that he was able to report, you know, this is what I've done and I feel pretty confident I've got sovereignty. Yeah, so he was kind of uh, racing, beating the gun a bit. Um, but if you look again at um, the debates and the discussion at Waitangi, um, it's absolutely clear that um, the, the, there are two intentions going on, two people, two groups, or two, two uh, players um, with different intentions, but there's Hobson trying to fulfil his instructions to get uh, to carefully explain or fully explain he was required, which he didn't do, um, and to get free agreement, which he, in, in a sense, he did, but only with the proviso that there would be some sort of shared authority. Yes, uh, he was presented. Uh, he presented, of course, that. Um, that the British government would set up a civil government, a kawanatanga, which would help control Europeans. And then when you look at the treaty, which is a Maori treaty, it's not the English treaty. If you look at the Maori treaty, you can see from the actual words that Maori are guaranteed tino rangatiratanga. And if you look at what you've got on your seats, you can see that it was the, in, it was the word used for independence in 1835. And it's not surprising that in a lot of the discussions that were well reported um, in our documents just upstairs here, um, government documents that say um, that Māori have said at different, 
times in the 50 or so meetings on the treaty, we can't really understand that this is really changing much. Um, you know, we're, we're, it's still what we've got. Um, and that's why you, you get some great quotes from Nopara Panakarawa at Kaitaia, who really tried to get, get at this sovereignty business. What do you mean by sovereignty? And the missionaries there and said, look, it's just the shadow of the land. It's not the substance. You know, so there's kind of two intentions going on with the players in the treaty field. There's also, I think, two intentions going on with the 1835 declaration too. But the continuity we have to think about is that agreement to some shared authority in the country and that authority coming from the land here which is a different kind of authority um, from the British legal authority mm -hmm. that came with Hobson. So this is why you know, I think it's, it kind of might have helped um, a little bit to sort of round up some of the issues that I started to touch, touch on and then moved away. And I hope that's the case. We yeah. can um, elucidate a bit more of the questions yeah. as we go well, on. Well, I mean, I think there are a number of really important things that you, you, you were touched on there. I think uh, the, the idea that that we have, um, that what what was the agreement that comes from the treaty with these two different perspectives actually, that what Māori were talking about was um, this, uh, the, the role of the Crown would be to regulate settlers, the population, the Pākehā population, and that their rangatiratanga, as they'd set out in, in Hifakaputanga, was to be guaranteed and protected. And I think that also brings up what I think is an important point about um, the difference between a declaration and a treaty, because although, as you say, there, there might have been two different intentions with the declaration, where Busby he might have had um, lots of ideas, lots of ideas. Wanted, yeah. yeah, but actually a declaration is, is really a unilateral statement. It's really about the rangatira saying uh, that here's a statement of our autonomy and our authority. The treaty, of course, is different because those two different perspectives are about two parties or more parties, perhaps, coming to an agreement on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to think of um, when thinking about the you know, two different spheres of power. You mentioned mm. Moana Jackson. That's how he puts it. Kawana Tanga and Tenora Matira Tanga. Kind of, I really like to think about those two as Kawana Tanga as kind of derivative. So it's been carved out of Tenora Matira Tanga. What? They were affirming in 19, uh, 1835, um, you could argue, then simply reaffirming mm -hmm. um, with the treaty that power of Tino Rangatira Tanga, but this time saying, let's carve out you know, Kawana Tanga for you, you settlers, for the Crown, Queen Victoria, Toei, whoever it is. So I think that's, I quite like to think of it, at it that way as a sort of reaffirmation rather than you know, something completely new or something you know, completely divorced. Yeah. So I actually think that's really interesting, and in, and in fact, what probably uh, people don't realise is, is that after 1840, um, it was really only a paper sovereignty. I think Jamie Vellich calls it that, and certainly that's the way I've always seen it too, because basically life went on for most Maori the way it had for a long time, and you only um, start, and it's only gradually that the difficulty of civil government being gradually established. And uh, let's face it, Hobson didn't have much in the way of resources. And so it's only as civil government gradually starts creeping across the land that it impacts on Māori. And that, of course, is, is in relationship to the guarantee of protection of land immediately. Um, and it's only really as the uh, powers shift from the governor um, to the settler government in the 1850s, 1854 on, and an evening of population numbers by 1860, that you start to get you know, huge uh, conflict with the two uh, different treaties that we're talking about, and the two different intentions, and the two different understandings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the other things that, that uh, you touched on the fact that, that Busby had all these ideas, um, and Morgan, in your comments, you talked about the idea of he um being something that, that was relevant outside of the north. Now, I'm kind of interested in, in thinking about uh, where you see he coming from. Is it, is it something that's from Busby? Is it a Ngāpuhi thing? Is it something that's relevant to Aotearoa as a whole? Well, maybe you can... 
Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, from what I know, it didn't seem to be relevant to the rest of the country, or at least um, Māori until the 1970s, where there was that movement to sort of claim and redefine this document as an alternative to the treaty. It didn't appear to feature um, in a lot of Māori communities before that, outside the north, as far as I know. Um, so I think that seems to be the moment where it was put to that, not first political use, but perhaps the first political use in the late 20th century. Mm. I think that seems to have been the moment rather than a kind of con some sort of continuity from the 19th century. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a hard one mm. to say. But of course, you go into some communities, like I mentioned Nasi Awa communities, who still, if you ask them, mm. they, will, you know, they will claim it despite not uh, having very you know, little mm. influence over it and having not even signed it. Mm. Well, if you, if you think about it though, in um, going back uh, to the early period, then I think it's more comprehensible because Busby was actually a pretty well educated guy and I've been researching him in the last year for Waitangi uh, for the Treaty House and I realised that he was aware that British authority in many parts of the world, as I think uh, Cowan has touched on, um, was very variable. Um, and the, he, he, for example, knew of the uh, various states to the north of India where British authority um, really was only perhaps one person and that generally um, the, whatever the peoples of that area uh, used uh, in, in forms of authority and structures kept on existing. And there may be just one person, you know, a, a Brit, of course, um, who could see, oversee this. And I think that's what he thought in terms of the Hei Putana in 1835, that it could be useful in the final uh, sense anyway, if, if Britain did decide uh, to do anything about New Zealand and, and try to make a treaty, then there would be a body that he could make uh, a treaty with. Mm. It, that was the Confederation. So, I mean, it's got a very interesting um, understanding, and I hadn't realised how important this was. He, you know, he called the treaty the Magna Carta, and um, I think that's something that you know, maybe somebody here will ask about later, because that again is shared a shared kind of sovereignty that I hadn't fully even understood myself until really last year. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I think one of the one of the things that I just wanted to pick up on there was you talked about the kind of importance of the coming together in a body that Busby could deal with. So, and one of the things that people often talk about here, Fakaputang, as being a kind of important development is this idea of collective of, of people in the north operating collectively between the different hapu and iwi in the north there. Um, and, and, and as you say, we, we, we get the term he wakaminanga to describe that collective and that gets referred to explicitly when we come to Te Tiriti o Waitangi again. So is that, I mean, I know there's some debate around whether that was actually a change or not. I know Ngāpui gave evidence at the tribunal, for example, say, well, we were already starting to collectivise um, in, in response largely to, to Pākehā settlement. So do you think that, that that is a change that can be put down to Hifakaputanga, or is it exacerbated by it? Or well, I'm, I'm happy just very quickly to answer that, because one of the things I found is that the, the North had been talking about it for several decades, I realised, and then before Hobson came in 1839, he got this message from Waimati North, actually, that uh, one of the missionaries there said, I think you better know, Busby. Um, there are big meetings up here. Uh, they're getting worried about sovereignty, their sovereignty, and what's going to happen in New Zealand. Um, and we think we should elect a king. Um, but we can't make up our minds who it should be. Um, and uh, they put forward a name, Hakiwa, uh, and Busby found that this wasn't really going to work very easily because um, it was difficult. There were so many independent hapu um, that the chief of the Waitangi area, so Atik should be me, and Waikato, um, the man from the outer bay who brought a lot of the early trade into the bay, felt it should be him. And then what about Kawiti? Um, you know, so they realised it was going to be very difficult. Busby said, I don't think it would be very diplomatic if I did anything about this. 
because I know if somebody's coming, I know a concert is coming. So, you know, it's interesting that you, there is a history there of earlier period in the Bay of Islands, and it, it may well be that elsewhere in the country, I think, as more research is done, uh, other iwi are going to find that there are, there are uh, the ways are that Maori had had to judge how to handle the changes that were happening in the country in some areas, especially on the coast, that were massacred, mm. actually. So there may be other stories, but mm. certainly what mm. you've said, how it, that others have started to think about that, too. Mm. And maybe it explains, too, why they said, look, Tinatui, the problem's yours. Do something about the treaty. And that was traditionally, over, I mean, over a century, that's what many of the other iwi said. You brought the canoes on shore, half our canoes. Now what are we going to do? Our relationship with the Crown is not a good one. Picking up from that uh, collectivisation point of yeah. um, perhaps Napoli doing it first, um, if we can use that term, as Claudia kind of explained, it probably because the stakes were higher for them and they were much closer to the rest of the world than um, mm -hmm. in other parts of the country. Um, and when you look at, say, Natal again to use that example. Um, we didn't collectivise until the stakes were also high for us. And uh, to borrow a phrase from your book, the Crown came to assert a substantive sovereignty. That's where Ngāti Awa collectivised. It's, it's Ngāti Awa Whakatane, where the war originally begun over James Falloon and his uh, death. But then there was Ngāti Awa on the Rangataiki Plains, where the Crown forces actually invaded. They never got to Whakatane. Um, so I think that was a, those moments for when I think that collectivisation sort of became a necessity, and perhaps without those same historical facts, they might not have happened in the same way. Mm. Yeah, and I think I, uh, that's a really good point because I think we can look at actually that move towards collectivising in the face of risk or threat as being something which is, has always been part of uh, kind of uh, Maori social organisation. I mean, if you look at Angela Bellara's work. Um, she says, well, actually, hapu were very fluid and would um, break apart, come together, confederate as iwi um, for different purposes and different needs. So perhaps the he whakaputanga can be seen as, as part of that, that kind of tradition as the other examples that you've talked about in the kingitanga too, of course. Kingitanga, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So um, you've mentioned a few of the people who were, a few of the rangatira who signed, um, and I just wonder whether, because uh, I think it's, it's important to get a sense of, of actually um, and understanding the importance of the he of, of who was signing. I don't, did, did you want to mention any others or talk about the kinds of people that we had collected there? I think it's uh, useful to have a look at the book um, and, and something that I put on your seat um, in, in the sense that um, Busby really had already knew the key people in the north before he came to New Zealand. I discovered he had a whole list uh, that somebody had given him in Sydney. Um, and th this is what, you know, he really went to, to get to their support for the independence of the country against foreign, other foreigners, especially France, actually, which they were really worried about. Um, I think some of the, the people we knew pretty well um, I think Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, we've done quite a lot of biographies on Maori and in Te Reo also. Um, but one of the really wonderful things about this exhibition and the book is that uh, Jared Davidson, one of the uh, ar archivists in National Archives, and also um, uh, the lady who is also here, Steph, um, the other curator, um, had done a lot of work with me on identifying those signatures um, in 1835 and on the treaty. In other words, creating a big database of information. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the people, we're not talking about people who are inexperienced. We're actually talking about someone like Kawiti, who 1816 had been to Sydney, had a good look around, stayed there for a while, and came back and then told the Agri, the English think much of it. Largely, largely because of the violence. And he felt it was disgusting that somebody would be hung for pinching a piece of pork. You know, uh, it was really interesting that you, you had sort of quotes of the Maori making comments um, on 
you know, a penal colony uh, mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they, and also you expect the toing and froing. Someone like um, Wakanini had one who was uh, largely based uh, at Waiheke Island in Auckland. He'd gone north to sign, a uh, brother of Wakanini from the Hopelands. You know, these were men who'd gone back and forth to Sydney several times. Um, I think I found somewhere that the Sydney Harbour Masters proved was Maori. Um, one stage they had a house in, in, in Sydney where Maori could stay. But very much earlier than that, you get Tapahi. Um, you get the Tapahi Medal has just come to light recently. They have an auction in Sydney and now at Tapapa. Um, and you can see it there. And it was where, you know, that early chief, Tapahi, had actually stayed at Government House in Sydney for quite a while. Marston and the whole missionary relationship, which we haven't really touched on, to give it its due. It, it's important that that connection with um, the North had been very important, and then, of course, the way it expanded around the country. Mm. And also the assistance, both in London and in New Zealand and Sydney, with the development of uh, Te Reo as a, as a written language, too. Mm. So, you know, all these threads kind of have to come together with our history. And it takes time. And I think for many of us, we're at different stages of understanding. One of the interesting things is digitization. The only real reason why we could say so much about the chief um, is because digitization in archives, um, you can, Jared could go through massive files to sort of look at different things. We also found over 50 images of those. He both signed the treaty and, and, and also sometimes signed the declaration. So it kind of puts a face to who we're talking about. It's absolutely marvelous. Mm -hmm. We've put them in the book, now, yeah, so yeah. you can have a look. Well, and, and, and if you do, them, yeah, and if, if you do look at the names of the people who signed, they, you know, the names you're mentioning there: Kawiti, Tamati, Wakanene, I uh, mentioned Te Fero Fero and um, Te Hapuku earlier, um, Patuone. These are all really big names in the north. I mean, it really d does demonstrate that this was a collection of, of really important people there. And as you mentioned in your earlier comments, I think the, uh, when we came to signing Te Riti o Waitangi, that the Hobson and, and the British government saw it as really important to try and make sure that they got the signatures from those people who had signed. And, and they didn't get all of them, of course. They didn't get uh, very <laughs> yeah. They tried twice he wouldn't do it, but then he'd only just signed the Declaration of Independence, mm. and he might have been just simply puzzled mm. about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thinking still about, about the North and Ngāpuhi, but, but coming forward in time, um, I, I don't know whether you have any comments, Morgan, about we, the process that Ngāpuhi are working through now, particularly in terms of their treaty claims and settlement processes. Do you think He Whakaputanga speaks to the way still Ngāpuhi understand autonomy and authority in the north, and, and do you think that's playing a role in the kind of dynamics that are there? Yeah, I think so. Um, like, as you mentioned, it's, it's been the Waitangi Tribunal has looked at it as part of the claim, um, and I think it's essential not just for Ngāpuhi but for the country to understand then what those Rangatira thought when they were signing the treaty itself. Um, so I think it's essential, and we saw it last week at Waitangi White with Jacinda's mm. comments, we see it in the political tent, we see it on the marches where people still have their United Tribes flags. Mm. Um, so I think it's it's still relevant and I, it's a hard one because is it up to Ngāpuhi to actually define how it's relevant um, mm. in the 21st century, which is a, a difficult question because we've had the, the tribunal have a look at it, mm. they've come back and Ngāpuhi seems to agree with what the tribunal, mm. most of what the tribunal came out with. Um, so where do we go from there? Do Ngāpuhi take the lead, or is it something for Māori to claim, or indeed the country to claim? Mm. It's quite a difficult question, I think, is one that needs to be answered if we're actually going to take it forward. Mm -hmm. I just also wanted to pick up on, um, in that context, in terms of thinking about where we're heading, when you talked about uh, earlier He Whakaputanga being in partnership with Te Tiriti o Waitangi. So what, what does that look like? What does that... What yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I think what I meant by that is we can't understand what the Rangatira were doing with the treaty without looking to the declaration as well. So they weren't, uh, the British Crown wasn't bestowing Te Nō Rangatira Tanga, and nor were the Rangatira there necessarily creating this Te Nō Rangatira Tanga as something which was completely new. 
Rather, I think a lot of them would have seen themselves as simply reaffirming what they had done five years earlier with the declaration. So I think it's essential when we look at it today that we're not thinking of Tino Rangitiratanga as something that Māori just created out of nowhere. In fact, it was something that they had been exercising for what, 800 years mm. or so mm. beforehand. Um, so I think that's why it's, it's essential to see those two in partnership. Mm. Mm. Just on the on thinking about that rangatiratang concept and, and the idea that it, it has a longer history, um, uh, one of the things that, that some people will say is that the idea of tino rangatiratanga, which we see coming through in the treaty, is is a more recent development. That you know, at that time, uh, some of the evidence that I saw in the Waitangi Tribunal from uh, Pat Hohepa, uh, who's a linguist from Ngapuhi, um, was that the they used. They used, started using that tino rangatiratanga because they could see that the missionaries and Hobson and Busby were leaders and chiefs of a kind, were rangatira, but they were different kinds of chiefs, different kinds of leaders. They weren't embedded in a kinship network and community in the way that they were. And so they start using rangatira to mean the kind of professional leadership that Hobson and the missionaries are and start using tino rangatiratanga to describe their own autonomy and authority that's embedded there. So just a, I, I found that interesting when I, when I first came across that. Um, now, Claudia, you've talked a little bit about the effect of, of kind of digitisation, making information about he whakaputanga more accessible. But for a document that we see as part of the He Tohu exhibition, one of the kind of central documents of our nation's story, why, why is it that we, we, people don't know so much about it? But I think uh, they don't know so much about it because one of the, those clauses um, in He Whakaputanga was uh, what Busby had hoped uh, to bring the whole group of uh, those northern chiefs together again as a confederation where um, they could mm, sort of debate and discuss what to do um, with strangers coming in, foreigners coming in, what to do about land sales, especially younger chiefs starting to put up land for sale, which uh, senior chiefs didn't want even then. This was before 1840. And, and I think Busby's disappointment was um, that uh, it was very difficult to bring them together and uh, it, it erupted in fighting anyway, once again, because there were other things going on. Uh, it erupted in fighting in 1837 between two key uh, chiefs, actually, in the Bay. Um, again, I think it was over trade and, and at Russell, Kororarika, you know, who, who, who had the dominant right mm. for trade. It was 1837. Actually, Hobson had been sent in across from Sydney to see uh, what was going on and see if he could, uh, he offered to help settle it, and they told him to get away. He, they could settle it themselves, that there was tension that would settle itself. Um, and he put in a report as a result of that. Um, so, you know, part of this is, um, I sort of think I've lost the track of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, um, they didn't meet. That was the difficulty. Mm. They put wood, got wood for a parliament house, and it lay unused. Um, and I suspect Busby finally might have used it to build, build another couple of bedrooms on his house. <laughs> <laughs> because he had had to pay for the land and had to build that little two-bedroom house. What you actually see, those of you who've been to Waitangi and what you see on television, is now about eight rooms. It wasn't like that in 1840. It was just a two-bedroom house with a central hall. Um, so, you know, coming back to Hei Whakaputanga, however, you know, there wasn't a parliament house built. They didn't come together as a group, and, and the pressures increased. And so, again, in the documentation last year, I found people like Wakaneli and Paduoni and other chiefs actually coming and sitting down with Busby, often in the evening, and getting asked to dinner where one accidentally took mustard or a fork and could, had to get helped out of the room because it was so hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, really talking about the problems of you know, the changes going on, in, particularly in the north. They were actually happening in other parts of the country too. But what we've got such a good record of is of the north. 
and the difficulty um, of mm, this. Mm, mm. Um, and again, I mean, just that finding out that Maori had been meeting again in mm -hmm. 1838 and 39, saying, what are we to do? You know, the pressures are increasing. Mm. We can't necessarily control things. We need help. Yeah. Now it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps that not necessarily wasn't going to mean that they decreased their authority. Mm. That, they, that would be guaranteed, mm. confirmed with the mm. other word. Mm. Yeah, so, so we have this, this agreement in Te Whakaputanga that they're going to meet as a Congress to collectively pass laws, but that never actually happens. And then we have the treaty following hard on the heels of Te Whakaputanga, really. Um, uh, part of the, the, some of the evidence from Ngāpuhi I, I, I saw in the tribunal too, which I thought was interesting, was people saying, well, actually, we did meet. We just didn't meet in the form that Bus We didn't meet with Busby in, in the form in a parliament that he was expecting. Mm. Of course, we were talking to each other. Yeah. Um, and there was, of, yeah. of course, that, that move to collectivism that, that, and collective responses that you talked about. Well, I think we might move from this discussion up here to open it up now to... Um, questions uh, from the audience, um, and have we got, yeah, we've got a, okay, so we've got, we've got one microphone, so we might, we'll, we'll start over on this side, so there's someone here who's, who's got a, a comment or question. Uh, first of all, um, very nice to see you all here, and it's very um, interesting Learn about this uh, about the declaration, which uh, I suspect very few people focus on. But what really has stunned me is the piece at the end of the declaration that where Busby certifies that the above is a correct copy, according to the translation of missionaries. And if you make the connection, the title uses the word. Rangatiratanga, which is, you know, there's no question it is translated as independence, or rather independence is translated as meaning that. Um, given that the translator Williams was the translator of the other document, you know, if you were in a court, you'd be saying that that is the primary, independence becomes the primary word unless somebody makes it clear that they've changed the word. And that also, the word uh, is used for power, you know, in, again, the British have seized upon that, what Williams had, but that never appears in the treaty, but a different word conjured up, never used before, uh, a kind of word developed for the purpose, is used, and you know, the hypocrisy, one might say, of the guy who uh, had two words in the declaration, then, in, I mean, maybe not meaning to be a hypocrite, Williams, I don't think, would have, uh, but that if he let it go forward with a totally different meaning of Rangatiratanga than, uh, in his view, in, in the way it went in English, than um, he had used mm. previously. I have just asked one minor thing, which is Gilbert Mayer, Ma, signing this. Is that the Gilbert Ma? The, the Mayor. Of, it is. I think, it's yeah. senior. Gilbert, Gilbert Mayer, senior. The one who pursued the duty? Or the no. Oh. So that tells who they are involved in. <laughs> <laughs> Did, did you uh, very quickly, I've mm. always given Henry Williams the benefit of the doubt, and I think you've got to understand he'd been to Wellington on missionary business, Whanganui Atara, and uh, he'd encountered um, New Zealand company people and who, ha who had put pressure on for sales in this area. And the New Zealand company really undermined much of the British commitment not to get too involved in New Zealand, because once you get a private body organising to settle, uh, then settle outside of government control um, that forced the hands of the colonial office, as Peter Adams says here tonight, did a fantastic uh, thesis on, out of Oxford, um, that came out in 1977. And, you know, once you have the New Zealand company 
um, also sending in, and arriving in January 1840, before that treaty even, um, hundreds, several hundreds of settlers were arriving in Wellington. You know, so that, you know, you have a very interesting um, problem, I suppose, for someone like uh, those of in the north. And Williams had seen this coming, and he only came back to the north on the 30th of January. Hobson arrived on the 30th, 29th of, of January, and uh, poor old Williams went to Waimati North to have a rest. And the horses turned up at 11 o'clock at night saying, you've got to come back, please, to, uh, to Pioneer. Uh, Hobson has arrived and uh, he wants to talk to you about a treaty. <laughs> so, you know, if you, you, but Williams was, he was so appalled by what he saw happening at the Huron Company that I think that really strengthened his resolve um, to put, make sure that there was some clause in the treaty that he could accept. And Busby said, unless you put this clause in that guarantees Tinoranga Tuatanga, you're not going to get Māori to agree. And Williams and Busby had pretty much agreed at this stage that it was probably the best thing that could happen was some sort of British control. And what they didn't realise was going to be the extent to which settlement then took place and the extent to which the British government got into it too. So, um, you know, there are, there are lots of things that we're still finding out, which I think we've got to acknowledge about that. Uh, thank you very much indeed for all of this, uh, what you've been saying. It would be great to see uh, some of those kind of more detailed conversations about the Whakaputanga that have gone on over the years to see them documented. It's clearly a shape-shifting document, a bit like the Magna Carta, which you referred to yourself, Claudia. After all, that's come to symbolize a much wider range of freedoms than were actually negotiated by the barons and King John. But I'm wondering if one of the significances of the, the declaration isn't, uh, uh, if we trace the idea of partnership, the, the treaty being uh, between the two partners, which really only came into our consciousness effectively with the Court of Appeal in 1987. Uh, so perhaps the Whakaputanga was a representation, an early manifestation of a treaty partner in the form of the Confederation of the United mm -hmm. Tribes. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, they'd never met again. But here were the Rangatira forming, a, coalescing as a partner and that partner ultimately became Te Tawiti partner, and it has taken us 170 odd years, maybe mm -hmm. minus 20, 150 odd years or more, to really recognize the partnership in the treaty. Mm -hmm. And we're still fighting this today. We've got Hobson's pledge to go around saying, <laughs> but Hobson said, we are one people, so we don't need to worry about treaty partnership. We don't need to worry about honoring promises. We just are one people. Well, that's not really the whole story. I mean, I think, I th think you make, there's a really interesting point in there that, that He Whakaputanga, while it is about a statement of independence and autonomy, it is also about strengthening an alliance. Um, and we see that Busby is intimately involved in it, but it's also referenced to, to we're going to ask, the, seek the King of England protects our independence. And so very much seen as, as strengthening that alliance. And I, I think you make a good point that you can see that leading into Te Tiriti or Waitangi. Did, did you have yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you probably feel I agree with you. You could see the declaration as the beginning of this partnership. But I also tend to agree with the side comment you made about the Court of Appeal and this idea of partnership suddenly coming into vogue with um, Lord Cook and his honourable judges. I f tend to prefer, when we're talking about the treaty partnership, to actually think about or talk about um, power sharing rather than this partnership. And I don't think the declaration sits as comfortably as the treaty does with this idea of power sharing, um, simply because with the declaration you're affirming um, this thing, and with the treaty you're agreeing that, yes, we're reaffirming this thing, but we're also giving you um, this power as well. Um, so I, yeah, that's just my kind of ideological point against partnership. <laughs> Um, I gave evidence at the um, Te Putana on behalf of our Tupuna to Bill, and um, I didn't give uh, uh, anything 
Thanks, Dean Sue. Um, I did mm -hmm. ask questions around research, actually. Um, I had a dilemma in regards to the, the duties of William Hobson as consul. Now, in my research, I was trying to track down his um, job description, I guess, um, the consular job description, um, and I believe we don't have any such copy here in New Zealand. No. In fact, I think uh, Dr. Loveridge had the same dilemma when he tried to track that particular document down. Mm. Um, so that's, there is no answer, I guess, right now for me as to where that sits. It's very important for me to identify William Hobson coming into this country um, because there was contention, I believe, in the research around him proclaiming himself as a Governor General yeah, as opposed yeah. to a consular. And, and, and what does that really mean? Um, and, and the fullness in his duty in coming into this country. Um, that's one thing. The other thing um, I have a dilemma about is the non-signatories to the treaty in Te Tuiti as our tūpuna, mm. the Whiro Whiro didn't sign a GM state clearly and, and we understand that. Mm. Um, and what does that mean in constitutional um, arrangements as, as if we sit here and ponder a constitution of this country. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm seeking answers, so, yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about the Hobson's role? Um, you're quite right that some, some documentation doesn't exist, or if it existed, we, we haven't been able to lay our hands on it, even at our site, actually. Um, or at ISPSA, it might not even be available at, in London either. But um, he was sent as consul and he preempted the treaty meeting by declaring that he was also the Lieutenant Governor being sworn in in Sydney. I think they were just frightened of things getting out of hand and um, land speculators moving so fast that it would become a shambles. So he doesn't, didn't just say he was Lieutenant Governor. He also made a statement about land and uh, that there would be no more land purchase and that everything that had been purchased up till then would be investigated. Um, there was one Maori attendant there and signed his name, Moka, actually, from um, sort of the uh, Koima, uh, Kotaritanga, uh, not Kotaritanga, from the Kororarika area. Um, and he knew very well, and he was one of the ones that brought it up at the treaty meeting. He said, I don't actually believe for one minute that those who've bought land, um, if they haven't been uh, paid uh, justly for it, um, that if you decide the land should be given back, I don't believe we'll get it. Actually, he proved to be right. Hobson denied it at the meeting. No, 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 he said, no, no, we'll investigate it, we'll give it back. In fact, it was kept by the Crown, yeah. any surplus land was kept yeah. by the Crown. So, you know, there's some very unfortunate things um, that you can very clearly justify in just from the written record and so on. I haven't got the answer to you quite um, because you have a settler government and also from the 1850s, but you also have the British government really shedding its responsibility to the New Zealand government. And you know, then that great war that affected the Waikato, really, which was an invasion, um, you know, was another attempt by the settler government to impose sovereignty in New Zealand. And then law, war and law, I always say, the two things that um, uh, finally impacted on Māori and created what you call substantive sovereignty. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Jamie Ballach always brought to us. Mm. So, and, and just on the point of the non-signatories part, I know the way in which the Waitangi Tribunal dealt with this in the case of its Te Uruwera inquiry, because of course Te Tiriti was never taken into Te Uruwera either, um, 
And the, the tribunal said, well, the Crown has behaved as though it has assumed authority here. Uh, and so we're going to treat this, in the case of, of Tuhoi, we're going to treat the statements in Te Tiriti as a kind of set of unilateral promises that the Crown has made with kind of no obligations from Tuhoi. But, um, but those, are those guarantees that are in Article 2 are to apply to, um, to all Māori because of the way in which the Crown has assumed uh, that, that responsibility and the substantive sovereignty as we saw. The Attorney General in 1842-43, uh, Swainson, William Swainson, wrote to, the, to London saying, what are we going to do about Māori who haven't signed? Um, are they still bound by the treaty and, and British sovereignty? And the reply was, don't think any other way, yes, the whole lot are, whether they signed or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, in fact, he also um, encouraged them to think that they weren't amenable to the British law. That was Swainson himself. Um, oh, that's quite true. Yes. They asked an important question. Mm. Should Maori be uh, forced mm. to mm. obey British law if they had other ways of dealing with their mm. problems too, which is perfectly true, they did. So you, again, you get to the conflict of voices between British law and, and tikanga mm. and hitanga mm. in the Māori mm. area and how things were handled. Mm. Mm. But there is, uh, there is a, that important legitimacy perspective that we touched on That's earlier, that, that, that part of the reason why the British officials wanted to get the people who had signed here Whakaputanga was because they saw that as, as legitimising um, the assertion of, of, of constitutional authority or sovereignty in their terms. Yeah. I think we've got another question down here. Uh, yeah. um, given that Te Whakaputanga is foundational in Ngāpui's thinking, um, indeed, as they said in one of the tribunal hearings, Te Whakaputanga is the father, Te Tiriti is the son, um, it, it's always puzzled me that, that uh, Whakaputanga does not seem to have been mentioned very much in the discussions on Thursday the 5th. Um, am I wrong about that? But I, in Kalenda, uh, you know, we have only to do with his memory. But, but does this mean they, assu they assumed that everybody knew about it and there's nothing to discuss, given that there's only four that some years earlier? Or, or was there could be other reasons why it wasn't discussed during this pivotal pre-signing moment? when so many other things were going on. I dearly wish we, we, we could say that um, we can read it in, into the debate that's now recorded, but we can't. However, I did find one reference to it. Bunbury, um, who was an, a major that brought troops from Sydney in April 1840, uh, was given a copy of the treaty to take down the coast to Tauranga. He kept on going. He went all the way down to Stewart Island, actually, so that the Agro and Otago signature um, uh, on his copy of the treaty. Um, he was talking at, uh, ta at, ta at Tauranga, and he explained, and, it, and the record is there in his own writing, um, that um, the, the step taken in 1835 had not worked, and this was another step to try to get things working better which is very interesting. So one therefore has to assume, and you've got to sometimes make historical assumptions, that it was understood even at Tauranga that there'd been a declaration of independence. Not surprising because the, the, what we forget is um, Bush Telegraph was strong and also Maui were up and down the coast hugely. We kept finding in the, in the trying to identify who'd signed the treaty, we found people all out of their, their usual area. And you know, even um, down in Apotiki, the, the, the trader who took one copy of the treaty down the Bay of Plenty coast, um, he had one man on board the, the ship, Papatea, who'd signed in the, Bay, in the Bay of Islands, Hokianga, and somebody else who hadn't signed. One was a Catholic, one was an Anglican. So I think he took those down the coast, which also explains when you look, if you look at the one went down the Bay of Plenty Coast, the Pugard copy, um, the, the Anglican said, anyone who's a Catholic should put a cross by their name. And that's why you see little crosses beside four of the names. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, so there's sort of a whole range of puzzling and interesting things mm -hmm. that are still waiting for us to unravel, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Give us some of those names. 
some of the names of those who signed here, Whakaputanga. Yeah, so some, some of the ones that, that we've, we've mentioned already are, are Kawiti, uh, Patuone, Tamati Wakanene, uh, Te Whero Whero, uh, Te Hapaku, and, and as I say, and, and you're absolutely right that they're, they're, they're not significant because of their individuals, they're significant of, of who they are representing uh, in that context, and, and you're absolutely right that it, it's the hapu that they're, they're signing for. So I think we, we are at the end of our time here, um, so I'm just going to hand back to Richard to wrap up for us. Ha, 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 ha.